Hello and welcome back to Codes of Connection. I am today, I am with TJ Woodward. I've had the pleasure of interviewing TJ. I believe this is the third or fourth time. We were both San Francisco Bay Area originally living there where we met and now we've both moved on. I always, whenever I do one of these things, I always think of TJ because of his way of being, his humor, the work he does in the world, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. and. He is, in my experience, one of those people that is dedicated to people connecting back home to their true nature and their true and their consciousness. He is literally a stand for that, and you're going to see in a minute. So let me, oh, I would love to introduce him to you with his bio. DJ Woodward is a best-selling author, inspirational speaker, and revolutionary recovery expert who has helped countless people through his simple yet powerful teachings. He was given the honor of being, oh, I love that, ordained as an agape minister by Dr. Michael Beckworth with, and was also the founding minister of Agape Bay Area in Oakland, which was the first satellite community of the Agape International Spiritual Center in LA. TJ is feature, a featured thought leader on wholehearted.org with Brene Brown, Marianne Williamson, Dr. Gabor Mate, which is huge, and Mark Lundholm, as well as a featured thought leader in the upcoming docu-series, Addiction Revealed. So that sounds like it's already been released. He is also the creator of the Conscious Recovery Method, which is a groundbreaking and effective approach to viewing and treating addiction. He is the author of the best-selling books, Conscious Being, Awakening to Your True Nature, Conscious Recovery, A Fresh Perspective on Addiction, and Conscious Creation. <laughs> He's done so much. I love it. Five Steps to Embracing the Life of Your Dreams, as well as the co-author of many workbooks. And I have used his workbooks in his books in my own work with clients. Woo! So welcome. Wow. Thank you. That I, I sound busy, don't I? <laughs> It sounds awesome. I'm like, he's on fire. <laughs> so um, let's just talk about, let's start with the word. You, you, you have the word conscious in much of your, your, your titles and in your work. Tell me in your terms, what does it, what does consciousness mean? Well, conscious really means a couple of different things to me. One, fundamentally, it's awake to your true nature, being conscious of who and what we really are, uh, how I like to say it, who we really be, right? We come into the world as whole and perfect spiritual beings, and then we get programmed by the world to forget that. So the, the deepest, I think, uh, definition, if you will, of conscious is to be awake to that. But it also shows up as being aware of what's in the unconscious and how that is for many of us running the show, whether we realize it or not. So the work, if you will, is to bring things out of the unconscious into conscious awareness so that we can start to actually choose our life instead of being run unconsciously by the programs that we were given as little people on planet earth. <laughs> Such a good answer. It just break, breaks it down. So let's talk about when you say in the subconscious mind and programming, uh, break that down for us. If someone's watching and they're going, wait, what does he actually mean by programming and, and by the subconscious? Yeah, so we receive messages usually when we're really little um, and these messages become my favorite word, concretized in the unconscious and that we develop what I call core false beliefs. I like to add the word false because I want to acknowledge that these are lies we've picked up about ourselves. Some of us aren't even aware that we're holding them, but many of us are aware of them. And usually there's something like, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable. We carry these around. And truthfully, they're not really thoughts only. They're actually frequencies as well. So we're walking around with the frequency of I'm not good enough. And no matter how hard we try in the conscious realm to make things happen, and I'm using that language consciously, uh, these unconscious programs keep showing up repeatedly in our lives. Yes. When you, okay. This is, this is one of the reasons I wanted you on here so much because what you're talking about is all connection. Like we're gonna we're gonna bring it back, like either disconnection or lack of connection. And so with the frequency piece, let's say someone I have, I have two questions. 
someone's holding the frequency of I'm not good enough. And even if they're doing like all the affirmations and, and they're they're faking it till they make it, can you talk about um, the frequency of that, even if it's like deep down and what someone can do to release that frequency of I'm not good enough or whatever the lie is? Yeah. Yeah, I love that because, you know, the affirmations and a lot of the practices that we hear and that we use are really useful to an extent. But if we're not also addressing the unconscious or what, you know, we might call it the shadow, um, these unconscious core false beliefs, if we're not aware of those, the affirmations are limited. You know, the spiritual practices, the vision boards, the, no amount of work that we do. Most of us reach a turn point where all of that either gets us to a certain point and we're like, mm, there's more here. Or we find ourselves, you know, on a hamster wheel and trying so desperately to work with these core false beliefs, but we find ourselves exhausted and frustrated. And the way we actually start to work with them is look at when they got implanted. And when I say implanted, I don't necessarily mean someone, you know, my kindergarten teacher wasn't trying to damage me, right? She was doing what she thought was the right thing to do, but I absorbed so much from my environment you know, from my parents, from school, from church, all these messages, right? And then I disconnected from my true nature. And that seems to be true in all the clients I've worked with as well. So the deeper work is really going back and looking at where this originated and how we have a place of tenderness and compassion for the, that inner child or that little person who made these huge decisions with very limited information. And you, you saying like your teacher didn't mean to like, cause they're like, just to use that example, she was operating from her stories and her programming. And then it can be this miss, miss this whole like shit show, excuse my, my language. And then <laughs> all like disconnected. So when you say I, you know, I became disconnected in my programming, let's talk about, cause you work with addiction and addiction comes mm -hmm. in many forms. It's not just drug and drugs and alcohol. So let's say like someone's right. disconnected, right? We pop out from the true self and it leaves this opening. Um, let's just talk about some of the pitfalls that happen mm -hmm. when we're disconnected. Yeah, I mean, it, it it becomes profoundly simple, right? When we disconnect from our true nature, we start looking to the world to bring us connection. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but it either one doesn't work or two, it's limited, right? So if I feel damaged and broken, in other words, um, in my own journey at, at the age seven, I remember a profound experience of closing my heart. And it was at that moment. Now, it was also a process, but that was a significant moment where I felt myself disconnect from my effervescent self, my present self, my open self, you know, pre-programmed humans, two years old, three years old. They everything that we're looking for in a in therapy or in recovery or in a spiritual practice is already innate with them. So that must be true about us, right? So um, when we disconnect from presence, from feeling our feelings, from wanting very much to connect with the world because we're connected with ourselves, when that disconnection happens, then we start looking to the world to bring us that sense of connection, achievement, addiction relationships, right? All of these things. And then ultimately, it doesn't really heal that part of ourselves that feels broken. Yeah. Oh, it's so true. It's so true. And it, we've seen, I know I, I went through my own addiction and looking for the outside um, to fill it. And it could, let's say it could happen for years, right? Someone could be disconnected for years. Let's say someone's watching this and they're going, you know what, I think I'm doing that. Or, you know what, like I do that <clears throat> with my work. I do that with my partner, even where I give my partner all my power. I want my partner to make me happy. If they're in a, in a phase listening to this going, I think that's me. What's something that they can do to start the process of coming back home? 
Well, a, a wise person once said there are three steps, awareness, awareness, and awareness. And many of us aren't even aware that we're in that kind of process, right? We find ourselves saying, but my partner should listen to me more. They should be more available to me. Um, they should know what my needs are, right? Those are some of the ways that we know that we're looking for our partner to help us feel connected. Now, that doesn't mean that our, you know, we're in a partnership and we have an agreement to be there for each other. But what we're talking about about is something a little deeper. We're talking about realizing that like no amount of a promotion at work or opening another business is going to help heal ultimately that which is happening within us. So when we're aware, aware, and aware, we can actually start to unplug from the conditions of the world and start to plug in how do we, because that's the question, right? How do we reconnect? Um, it's very different than looking at how I get somewhere, how I achieve something. It's how do I return to this inherent place of wholeness within me that already exists? Like that already exists is the key is the key word. Um, I remember just quickly, I was like friends with someone who um, I realized after a while, this was years ago when my daughter was young, there was like abuse happening um, in with her children. And I remember the moment it felt like a moment to me when her daughter had light in her eyes and then the next time i saw them the light was gone it was just gone and i could i could feel it and see it like something happened so she's gonna have her journey of of coming back to herself and what i hear you saying is it's possible so let's talk about um the ego there's you're doing some really beautiful work around consciousness and ego. Can you describe what the ego is and how, how it's our friend and our foe? Yes, I love the way you framed that, right? Because it is indeed both. Um, the ego gets a bad rap. Uh, my friend, Dr. Sue Mortar, I heard her speak one time and she said, only ego would want ego to die. And when I heard that, it was like, oh, yeah, that's that's my my personality self. So the ego, a lot of times we think of ego as like that we're really inflated or we're really full of ourselves. Right. But the ego really is a, a collection of ideas, stories, our personality or what I call brilliant strategies. Right. So rather than coping mechanisms, I call them brilliant strategies. For example, um, in my third book, I write, I, I I follow these two characters and they're they're loosely based on people I know. But one character, she's she's a lawyer, she's a high achiever, um, straight A's, like really, really a, a person who is achieving. But she keeps finding herself frustrated because she gets the promotion and still doesn't feel fulfilled. She gets the next thing, but she's longing for something deeper. And she realizes that really at the core of it is I'm not worthy. And because of that, her ego, right, her story or her strategy is to achieve. It's to, you know, to work 12 hour days, 16 hour days to be better, be better, be better. She finds herself feeling emptier and emptier the more she achieves, right? And so the ego is really just our personality. It's the way that we deliver. It's the way that we show up in the world. And there are a lot of people who say we must be rid of the ego, but for me, it's really more, how do I use the ego, but realize that that's not who I am? In other words, I have thoughts, but I'm not my thoughts. I have opinions, but I'm not my opinions. I have a personality, but it's not the ultimate truth of who and what I am. So with the ego, if that's the personality and which I complete that the way you said that's perfect and it doesn't like you said make it bad it's not about being inflated it's about what i heard you say was being in a balanced relationship with the ego so let's say someone's listening to this and we all know when you're in the midst of an inflated ego or in the midst of a deflated ego low self-esteem mm -hmm. but what can you say tj if someone who's like you know what i really want to be an um balanced relationship with my ego so what are some things that i can do you mentioned awareness and what else can you bring into into that balance because as humans i do think we need it 
Right. Well, right. yeah. Otherwise, I don't think we would be here. Right. Yeah. And, you know, once the ego is gone, I'm going to guess we no longer need to be on Earth. And maybe, you know, maybe that's true for some people. But um, I think that it's twofold for me. It's a twofold process. One, it's cultivating a relationship with the essential self. And for me, that means a meditation practice that involves spiritual community. It involves being really aware of who I really am, reconnecting. Um, I love the way you uh, framed the, the light in the eyes, right? And of course, it's a heartbreaking story to know that those lights went out. And that's true for just about 100% of the humans I've met. And so the essential self is that light that's in the eyes. How do I cultivate a relationship with that essential self? And then the second part is pretty much questioning and unlearning just about everything I've ever been taught about myself and the world and looking through the lens of compassion. Krishnamurti said the highest form of human intelligence is to see ourselves without judgment. So from this place of wholeness, I can look at the ego or the personality and I can start to observe it and question it and start to unlearn some of these ideas that I'm carrying around. And without what you also said was holding yourself without, without judgment. Yeah. Because that's, I actually, before we got on today, I did a meditation on forgiveness because mm. my friend and I, we, we were in a, I want to be right story uh, or, or, you know, conversation last night. And it didn't, we just ended with, I'm right, you're not, uh, you're wrong. And so I went and did this like forgiveness meditation, but it dissolved it all. Like, so what yeah. you're saying is like, and even you could do that with yourself, right? Like you could do something that dissolves it all, begin to dissolve it. Yeah. And, and, you know, opinions are great because um, we often hear there's your point of view, there's my point of view, and the truth is in the middle. And I actually have a different paradigm. And that is your point of view is 100% correct. My point of view is 100% correct because we all see life through our lens. So when I can start to move beyond the ideas of good, bad, right, wrong, and then be curious suddenly more connection can happen. You know, we have been told that we live in a polarized country and I don't think that's true. What seems true to me is we have been conditioned to have polarized thinking. And so what do I mean by that? What I mean is we have been deeply conditioned that we are right and someone else is wrong or I'm wrong. I must be wrong. Some of us live in that one. I lived in that one for a long time. Oh, I guess I'm wrong about everything. They must have all the answers, right? But we all have a different lens. And when I understand that, I realize that I'm not actually my opinions. And there's a lot of peace in that. Isn't it interesting that I'm thinking that? You know, I politicians get in trouble for changing their positions. And I think, oh my gosh, I hope I change my positions. I don't want to believe what I did 10 years ago about something. I'm evolving and growing. So life is perspective. And when I have that compassion for myself, I can have it for someone else. Even when I'm in the midst of what looks like conflict, but then I can start to laugh at it, honestly. Exactly. Like, like, even with my friend, like this one, like that was so, because we're both in the corners, right? And I love what you said is um, it, uh, per perception. It's, or they are teaching us. It's, what, how did you say it? They're teaching us to be, the society's teaching us to be, um, be right. We've but been conditioned to have polarized thinking. Yeah, yeah. Polarized thinking. So that brings me to, okay, well, we're, we're wrapping up and I have a couple more questions, which brings me to a big question around exactly that. Because before you and I re hit record, I was wondering if I could ask you about the things that we get to be aware of that we may not even be aware of that are happening currently in the world, such as what yeah. you just described, polarization. So can you name a few of the things that people just you get to be aware of even like the, the little sneaky things because we've got a lot to distract us here. Yeah, well, and and I, I want to invite anyone who's watching or listening right now just to lean into this a little because one of the ways I know if I'm an ego is I'm easily offended. And that doesn't mean it's bad or wrong. It's just I'm in that ego because it's very seductive to be right. It's very seductive to find our tribe, right? And there's a reason for that. 
through the evolution of humanity, we needed to have a tribe to survive. So when I hear people say, I'm looking for a community of like-minded people, I invite people to look at that. Are you saying that the only people you can have in your community is people who agree with you? That's a trap, right? I call it the, the opinion trap. If you turn on, I mean, a perfect example, turn on CNN, turn on Fox. I mean, I don't watch the news anymore, but I used to like to flip back and forth to hear the way they talked about the same exact event and it couldn't be more different, right? So we're literally being programmed and we start to believe this is my tribe and I must believe everything that they believe. And, um, you know, not, I don't want to be controversial about the whole COVID thing, but COVID was a great example of people were put into camps. And if you didn't agree with everything this group said, you might perceive you're going to be ostracized. So we find ourselves getting into group think. Now, how do we actually heal that and work with that? We realized that opinions are not as solid as we once believed. We look at when we get activated, formerly known as triggered, right? Because someone says or does something, a mask, a vaccine, it doesn't matter what it is, right? Something in our environment and there's something really seductive and that is the seduction of the ego, right? It, it's the hook. And then we build websites and TV shows. I mean, there are TV shows literally that are about activating people's ego. And, you know, that's the news now. They literally know how to hook it. You know, what we call news is such a small percentage of what's happening on the planet. There's so much love. There's so much connection. There's so much joy. And yes, these other things that we would call horrific are happening. But why did we decide that's news? And so notice when I'm getting the, back to awareness, awareness, awareness. Notice when I'm getting hooked. Notice my opinion. And notice, very, very simple, is this opinion or this point of view helping me to feel more connected or more disconnected? The answer is so simple. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not supposed to have opinions. It's just that's not who I am. And when I understand that, I can allow people to have a different point of view. I, I like everything you said. I love everything you said. And um, I love using the example of the news and yeah. thank you for bringing that because it's a trap. The trap is a great word. And I I also wonder if that word um, kind of rubs up against the ego a little bit. Like, nobody's going to trap me. You know, like, don't trap me. Like, you know, but it's also a good step toward awareness, activation, trap. So I have an even bigger question for you that may even support people even more of, like, really becoming aware. So here's a bigger question the why, let's say these like CNN for all these places, they're wanting polarization. They play into our ego. They play into us wanting to be right. Why? Like what, what's the, what's the reason if we're not, if we're being trapped, what's the result? Well, I, I, it, it might be conscious, but I think it's more unconscious than that. Um, my guess is people who write the news for both of those, that these examples, believe they're right about it. I don't think anyone says, oh, I'm wrong about this, but I'm going to pretend like I'm right about it, right? They have a point of view. And so when I'm deeply entrenched in my ego, I see the ego in others, right? And then we're in that conflict. When I realize that there's something much greater who and what I am, so the answer of the why is that ego it is seductive and it is there's something about being addicted to drama because that's really what's happening in our culture now and with the you know advent of social media and looking good and the comparisons and the you know the polarization all of that is really there's something that's and i keep using the word seductive but it really does seduce us into a trance where we believe that we're fundamentally different than other people because of our opinion, right? So I think the why of it in a very simple way is it's unhealed wounds projected outward. And then we build coalitions unconsciously of people that have similar wounds. And then we we, we call that either a political party or, a, you know, a, there's a group, a tribe. And again, I'm not, I want to be really clear. I'm not saying there's anything fundamentally wrong with that. What I'm saying is, is there a greater possibility for your life? Do you want more connection? And what would be required of you to get, have more connection in your life? It's so profound because 
what I hear you saying is we started at the the individual relationship to the self when we get broken off and then also full circle when we're adults and the seduction of continuing the game of disconnection. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, babies, little children don't inherently view other people as different or wrong or bad. And so we teach them all of that, right? So the, the, the spiritual journey is about returning to that place of open presence and curiosity. Like I said before, everything that we're looking for in therapy, recovery, a spiritual practice really is innate. I want more presence. I want to be able to feel my feelings. I want to feel more connected to people in my life. All of that is actually just who we are inherently. So what needs to be unlearned? You know, the, the Sufi poet Rumi said, we're not here to seek for love, but to look at the barriers we've put, I think, in, in the way of that. Um, that's a paraphrase, right? So what what, what have I? put on top of my ability to be present and loving. It's become so simple. It's like, so it is like when you, what you're, the way you're describing it is so simple, just coming back to love, coming back to the self. Um, and then yet we ha it's the drama. I love that you, you're the first uh, speaker I've interviewed that talked about the seduction of drama and gossip and all those things that keep us disconnected. Yeah. And when I feel broken, I see it everywhere. And when I, when I feel deeply connected with myself, I see that everywhere. That's it. It's like when you move somewhere new, we just moved here. You either, I like, we, I could have seen this place as the people are unfriendly and they don't, you know, welcome outsiders, whatever, or I can choose to see them as friendly and connected and I'm going to attract that vibration. That's right. I know it's it's interesting. You know, I moved to LA two, two and a half years ago. And when I say, oh my gosh, people in LA are so open and loving and kind. Some people are like, LA? Like, you know, I, they have a different story about LA, obviously, than I do. And of course, because of that, you know, life is what we call it. We're going to experience what we believe we're going to experience. That's a whole show we could do on quantum mechanics. But, you know, basically what we expect to see, we will see. Like one of my teachers wrote a book called The Problem is How It Is in How You See the Problem. That's right. Is like the perception, the perception. So as we're coming to an end, I would love to hear any last words from you around um you mentioned meditation, but any especially someone who is really working toward releasing drama, releasing anything that's keeping them from connecting from connecting. You mentioned forgiveness, anything else that you want to leave people with and what's possible when they're connected back to themselves. Yeah, I mean, what I want to leave anyone watching or listening with is something profoundly simple. You came into the world as a whole and perfect being that's still who and what you are beyond any wounds or any beliefs you have. There's a place within you that's unharmed and unharmable and you have access to it. And in this moment, I invite you to pause and unplug. Maybe it means turning the TV off. Maybe it means putting the phone down. Even if I can be two minutes aware, aware and aware of who I really am, life will change dramatically. And I know that this is the journey for all of us and you have everything within you to do that. And it only happens now. It's like, there's a new moment every moment, right? The new moment can be like, it's like now is what you're saying. It can happen right now. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's it. What's I'm gonna ask you one thing because you're so cute, and then we'll add, um, what is your favorite like thing to do, like personally? What do you love to do for yourself or for fun? Well, I mean, now we live in Marina Del Rey, so the most enjoyable thing that we can do now is walk our dog to the beach. We're just like a 15 minute walk from the beach, and you know, watching him run on the sand and that joy that a dog brings. I mean, that's just the first thing that comes to mind. Being there at sunset, magic. Uh, there's something, I have two dogs are right here. That's why I keep muting because they're snoring. That, but they, they're so <laughs> in the moment, right? They're so fun yeah. in the moment and they get us outside. All right, TJ, tell us about your free gift for our guests. Yeah, a free gift is actually three different courses based on my three books, Conscious Being, Conscious Recovery, and Conscious Creation. Uh, TJWoodwardFreeGift.com. You can access all three of the courses there. Amazing. And this will be 
on the speaker page. His website's there. The, the free gift is there. And even I highly, highly recommend getting the, the free gifts because as I mentioned, I used these workbooks, especially one of them, Conscious Recovery, in my own work and, and with my own clients. They're brilliant. They're um, a very unique, very spiritual approach to addiction. Oh, thank you, Beth. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for being with us and with me again. <laughs> Truly an honor. I loved it. <laughs> yes, me too. All right. My name is Beth Osmer and you've been listening to TJ Woodward. Thank you for watching Codes of Connection and I'll see you the next time.